Good morning and happy Sabbath. It is good to be able to worship with you. Welcome back to class. This morning, two of our instructors are at home making sure that they're not going to feel worse tomorrow than they feel today. So today I get to do all of the texts, which, you know, I, I know the Bradleys are watching and they know that I love them with all of my heart. I was a little jealous of the time they got to do speaking last week, but uh, not as jealous as I was of Steve the week before who got the whole time all to himself. But we have been studying the topic of prophets. Now, I'm going to do a recap of our last two class periods together, and that recap, by the grace of God, will take no longer than 600 seconds. So Jesus warned in Matthew chapter 7 that there would be what type of prophets at the end of time? False prophets. So since Jesus warned against false prophets, at the end of time, there will be what type of prophet? A true prophet. We have also, let me see if my clicker works here. Does my clicker work? Oh, look at there. What is about this? Does my, does my clicker work? Bobby Jean, does my clicker work? It don't work. Well, I keep hitting your finger and it's not working. Well, I, I looked at it already. Don't argue with me while I'm preaching. All right. So Jesus told us that at the end of time, there would be false prophets, which means that there will be at the end of times, time prophets that are true. So then the question we have to ask is, well, when is the end of time? When does the end of time begin? Are we living in the end of time? And so what we did in our class is that, by the way, Liam, you are in a level 400 college class right now, Okay. Enjoy it. This will be the easiest class because I, as an instructor, give you all the answers. Okay? So we discuss from Daniel chapter 9, verse 25, that there was a prophet, not 9, 20. I got to make sure I end up at the right time period, you understand. Just a minute, dear brother. Daniel chapter 8 and verse 14 gives us this 2,300-day prophecy. That 2,300-day prophecy began, come on, students, in what year? It begins with a four. Very nice. You see, Liam? It begins with a four. And they get it. When does it end? It begins with an 18 and ends with a 44. Okay, now somebody said 1798. Therefore, we are going to now jump to what the Bible talked about in Revelation chapter 12. The correct answer before was 1844. The 2300 days ends in 1844. By the way, the 2300 day prophecy is the longest time prophecy in Scripture. And since it culminated in 1844, and since it is the last time prophecy in Scripture before the second coming of Jesus, beyond 1844, you and I are living at the end of what? Time. No time prophecy after 1844 before the second coming of Jesus. That means that right now we are living during the time of the end. So somebody earlier said 1798. Revelation chapter 12 told, told us of this time period where this woman goes into hiding. And how long? Wait, wait, wait. What does a woman represent in Bible prophecy? Give me some Bible verses to prove it. Okay, so this is the deal, right? We just spout this stuff off. Because we know that that's the answer I'm looking for. That's what the answer has been for the last three or four Sabbaths. The Bible says that God likens his people to a comely and delicate virgin. And then in the New Testament, God does the same comparison. So this woman in Revelation chapter 12 that is distinguished from the beast power of Revelation chapter 12, represents God's people. 
And the Bible said that God's people, will, the woman, will go into hiding for how long of a time period? Okay, time, times, and half of a time. All right, and what did you say? 1,260 days, and elsewhere in Revelation it says 42 months. All the same time period. So God's people go into hiding for 1,260 prophetic days, which is equal to 1,260 literal years. Are you catching this? Okay, so here we are. Seven, oh, I almost gave you the answer before I needed to, Liam, forgive me. This 1,260-day prophecy begins in what year? Begins with a five, ends with an eight. Three in the middle. 538 A.D. is when it begins, and it culminates when? 1798. So it is after 1798 that God's people come out of hiding, and go with me to Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12, it's easy to find Revelation, last book of the Bible. Revelation 12, verse 17 says, And the dragon was angry with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed that have two characteristics. What are those characteristics? They keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. Couple that with Revelation 19.10. It says the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So after 1798, after 1844, we are expecting to see prophets arise at the end of time. Would it be outside of normal, since Scripture has prophesied that it would happen, would it be outside of normal to find a prophet beyond 1798? Liam, the answer is no. Is is it outside of our expectation to find a prophet after 1798? Liam knows the answer. What's the answer? No. That's absolutely right. So Jesus warned us against false prophets. So just very quick review here. Forward, Bob, not backward. Okay, so last week, William read for us this time prophecy that was given by God through Abram. And does anybody remember how long that time prophecy was? 400 years. That's absolutely right. And then God raises up who to call attention to that time prophecy? He raises up Moses. Then William, by the way, that was Rhett that called attention to it over there. Then William read about a prophecy by Jeremiah that God's people would go into captivity in Babylon for how long? 70 years. And who did God raise up to call attention to that time prophecy? Daniel. And then, and that was Rhett that read that. And then William read for us last week that Daniel gave this 483 prophetic day, literal year prophecy, and who was it that God raised up to call attention to that time prophecy? John the Baptist and Jesus himself. Then, and that was Rhett, by the way, and then William read for us last, I didn't click, Bob, you're ahead of me. Okay. I couldn't do this with anybody else. Bob can take it because Bob dishes it. Okay, so let's go. (laughs) Then Daniel gives this time prophecy in Daniel 8.14 of a 2300-year time period. Now, wait a minute. Since the canon of Scripture was closed in the 300 ADs, what does that mean? That means that they had this council and all of these different manuscripts were compared. The manuscripts that disagreed with other manuscripts were not included because those were seen to be not authentic. And that's how you and I ended up with the book that we call the Bible today. And some people say, hey, wait a minute. Wasn't that the Catholic Church that called that uh, meeting where they decided what was going to be in the Bible and what wasn't going to be in the Bible? Yes. It was. But check this out. The people that went to that council went to that council, council missing eyes, arms, legs, because they suffered persecution because they believed that the Bible 
was the word of God. And when, you're, when you give your arms and your legs and your eyes for something, you are true to that something. And so what you and I have here is not a book that was put together by one denomination or another. It was put together, it was compiled together into what you and I have as the Bible by individuals that sincerely loved the Lord Jesus and the truths that were contained in the letters and the books written by the prophets that you and I find in Scripture. So these prophets said, Daniel specifically says, that there is going to be a time prophecy that culminates in 1844. So since Abraham gave a time prophecy and Moses called attention to it, and since Jeremiah gave a time prophecy, and Daniel called attention to it, and since Daniel gave a time prophecy, and Jesus and John the Baptist called attention to it, when Daniel gives a time prophecy that extends beyond the, the, the canonization of Scripture, or the compiling of what you and I know as the Bible, when Daniel gives a prophecy that extends beyond and after the writing of Scripture has ended, since the prophets prophesied that it would happen, should we be expecting a prophet that shows up in 1844 that calls attention to the 2300-day prophecy? I mean, it's a no-brainer. All of these other prophets did the same thing. And so over here, God, who is consistent, was it Malachi 3.6? God does not change. That same God inspired the prophet Daniel to write that at the end of the 2300-day prophecy, somebody's going to call attention to that because Abraham and Moses, and you know, we just went through that, so why go through it again? So you did some homework. How many of you did your homework? Did you Google this? Anybody? Anybody? So in, did you search the internet for it? Maybe use a different browser than, or search engine. Than, what was that? Duck, duck, go? Okay. Um, what did you come up with? Okay, William Miller. All right. What else did you come up with? Joseph Smith, all right. Let, let me, let's do this. Mr. Baum. Hmm. Come here. Okay. So, I don't know if you can read that. I can read it for you. So, Joseph Smith was the founder of the Mormon organization. Uh, 1805 to 1844. Anybody find, well, you, you already said that, right? Okay. Uh, Andrew Jackson Davis, 1826 to 1910. Anybody find that? Okay. Say again. You found Sayyid Ali Muhammad, the Baha'i faith, 1819 to 1850. Uh, 1852 to 1916, Charles Taze Russell, Watchtower Society. 1821 to 1910, Maker Mary, you say it, Mary Baker Eddy, Christian scientist. Edgar Casey, the Sleeping Prophet. I know it's outside of the 1844 period, but some people are like, "Hey, what about this guy?" Charles Darwin wrote his first or wrote something called the Essay of 1844, which was the precursor to the origin of the species, the document or writing. Then there's 1827 to 1915, a lady named Ellen White, who was a Seventh-day Adventist. Now, this is what we are going to do. We know that there's supposed to be a prophet over here to call attention to the 2300-day prophecy. Let's just ask Joseph Smith, Andrew Jackson Davis, Sayyid Ali Muhammad, Charles Taze Russell, Mary Baker Eddy, Edgar Casey, and Charles Darwin if they talked about the 2300-day prophecy and brought up the topic of the sanctuary. Do you know what every one of them would say? No. No. We didn't, we didn't write about that. 
Only one of them wrote about it. Let's, let's ask another question. Go to Revelation chapter 12. I'm going to come back over here to the end of time. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 17. The dragon was angry with the woman. Revelation 12, 17. The dragon was angry with the woman, went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which have two characteristics. What were those characteristics? They kept the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. So let's ask Joseph Smith, what do you think about the Ten Commandments? You know what he's going to say? Ten, Ten Commandments are great. Well, please tell me, what do you do with the Fourth Commandment? Oh, the Fourth Commandment, that's done away with. You don't have to worry about that. So would he fall into that category of keep the commandments of God he would not. You will find the exact same thing with Andrew Jackson Davis, Sayyid Ali Muhammad, Charles Taze Russell, Mary Baker Eddy, Edgar Casey, and Charles Darwin. The fact is that there's only one of those individuals on the screen that talked about the 2300-day prophecy, that talked about the cleansing of the sanctuary, that comes along in 1844 and passes those tests it's not the Mormons keep going yeah it is it's doing it yep you see the little line that's popping up there oh nope you went too far there we go all right, so there's only one that talked about the 2300-day prophecy in connection with the cleansing of the sanctuary. So this is not surprising to us because we know that over here, there is going to be a prophet at the end of time. We just don't know who it is. So we do the research. We use whatever DuckDuckGo Google we want to use. And we find all of these different prophets... And there's only one that talked about the 2300 days in connection with the cleansing of the sanctuary that actually shows up in 1844. Now, you'd think I was crazy if I said you have to believe Ellen White is a prophet without sharing with you the biblical tests of a prophet. Once you have the biblical tests of a prophet, you can read what that prophet, what that individual says, and if they pass the tests, then what must they be? A prophet. So we're just going to give you the tests today. Fair enough? So I have a friend. His name is Rob Soto. Turn with me to Philippians chapter 4, verse 13. Philippians 4, verse 13. Nope. Philippians 4, verse 8. Thank you, brother. Philippians 4, verse 8. It says this. Philippians 4, verse 8. It says, Finally, brethren, Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. Whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest. I still hear your pages. Philippians is in the New Testament. It is beyond 1st and 2nd Corinthians. Beyond 1st and 2nd Corinthians, you have go eat popcorn. The pop is the Philippians. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians or General Electric Power Company, however you want to remember. You've heard that before, haven't you? What is your name? Reagan. I have a niece named Reagan. Are you related to Liam? He's your younger brother. So you're one of those two that aren't grown up, or you're one of those three that aren't grown up. How did you take that this morning when your dad said that? You were just like, that was not a good thing, Dad. I even wrote that down. Missouri, two are grown up, and I thought, hmm. What does that do to the others that are here? My kids later would have punched me in the arm and said, Dad, what's wrong with you? They may punch you later and say, why did you take us to that church? Okay, Philippians 4, verse 8. We should be there now, right? Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever 
Things are of good report. If there's any virtue, if there's any praise, think on these things. So my friend Robert Soto, when he's going to make a decision of something to do, an action to take, he will, or even thoughts that he thinks, he sees if they pass through that biblical filter. And if they don't get through the biblical filter, he's back there telling me, head, head falls off. Uh, not going to go there. And so when we have these tests for a biblical prophet, we can apply these tests and we can know if that person passes the test. Now, here's the challenge for you. We today are not used to thinking for ourselves. This is how we think. And we're like, oh, look at all that positivity. Ooh, look at all that negativity. I listened to something this morning about on YouTube about the health benefits of oatmeal. Gag a maggot. And I get it. It's good for my heart. Good to lower my cholesterol. Good for all kinds of things. It's a whole, it's a whole grain, right? Health benefits, James. I listened to Google to find out. I started out wanting to know the nutritional value of pistachios. Are those pistachios? This is how we think. What does that person say and I will adopt what they say? Or what does that person say and I will adopt what they say? That person, oatmeal. I know that many of you love it. With enough salt and butter, you can make that stuff taste good. So, instead of now asking the internet whether somebody was true or false... Maybe what we should do is think for our own selves and read the material with the tests of a prophet on a three-by-five card, and then when we read that material, we'll say, well, is that accurate? Is that really what happened? And we do our own thinking about it. I have a friend. His, he is in Australia right now, he and his family, and one day he printed off every, well, it was just from the first page, of a Google search. He printed off every document on the first page of his computer on a Google search that was negative about Ellen G. White, and it was a ream of paper. Now, let me ask you this. Did the people, when uh, Israel was going to go into captivity, did they appreciate what Jeremiah said? You're going to go into captivity. Did they like Jeremiah? No. When uh, Isaiah is telling them what they need to do and what's going to happen, do they like Isaiah? No. When uh, uh, prophets are told by God to give a message and people do not want to hear that message, that prophet gets talked about. So here's the challenge for each one of us. Read some material with the biblical test of a prophet. And if the prophet or the individual does not make it through that filter, toss them to the side. So here we are. You've been waiting for them. Let's go to 1 John chapter 4, verse 1. 1 John chapter 4, near to the book of Revelation. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 1. 1 John chapter 4, verse 1 says... Find the book of Revelation, back up beyond Jude, back up one more, third, second, 1 John chapter 4 and verse 1. Beloved, believe not every spirit, 1 John 4 verse 1, beloved, believe not every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are of God, because many, what? False prophets have gone out into the world. What does Jesus tell us what happened at the end of time when it, concerning prophets? That there would be false ones 
And so here now, under the inspiration of the Spirit of God, John writes that you and I have permission of God to test the prophets. Well, if you're going to test something, you need to know the answers to that test. I loved when the professor in college would give to us a uh, review. He'd hand it to us and he'd say, the only thing I'm going to ask you questions about is right here on these pieces of paper. Brother Soto, I was like, memorize, 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 then regurgitate, A+. plus." I like that. Most of us don't. Most of us do like that. And that's why we'd rather listen to Google or DuckDuckGo or Yahoo than to simply read it for ourselves. So we are going to test the prophets. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 8 and verse 20. Old Testament book of Isaiah. It is to the right of the book of Psalms. You have Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, Isaiah. Isaiah, we're going to Isaiah chapter 8 and verse 20. This is a test for a prophet. Isaiah chapter 8 and verse 20 says this. To the law and to the testimony, if they do not speak according to this word, it is because there is what? No light in them. You remember that? Amy Grant. Sorry. You remember that? I was on the wrong side of the pulpit. I'm supposed to read Old Testament over here and New Testament over there because of Miss Joella. Okay. You remember that song by Amy Grant? Thy word is a... Okay, so those of us that are that old remember it, right? To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to... His word, there's no light in them. The word of God is the light. And if it, somebody that is professing to be a prophet or a messenger of the Lord does not agree with what the Old and the New Testament say, is that individual a false prophet or a true prophet? They're a false prophet. So if a prophet over here in eight, beyond 1798, here in 1844, talking about the 2300-day prophecy, the cleansing of the sanctuary, if that prophet over here disagrees with what is in the biblical canon, that must be a false prophet. Because remember, it is the Spirit of God that inspired all all of the authoring of Scripture. So the Spirit of God made that prophecy through those prophets that over here there would be another prophet and Bill, who's going to inspire this prophet? The Spirit of God is going to inspire this prophet. Test number two. You're in Isaiah. Go to the right. Let's go to Jeremiah. Go to Jeremiah chapter 28. Jeremiah 28. Jeremiah 28 and verse 9. The Bible says in Jeremiah 28 and the ninth verse. Jeremiah 28 verse 9. Test number 2. What was test number 1? They have to agree with the what? With the Bible. Test number 2. Jeremiah 28 verse 9. The prophet which prophesies of peace. When the word of the prophet shall come to pass, then shall the prophet be known that the Lord has truly sent him. That's easy. If somebody is claiming to be a messenger of the Lord or a prophet or someone that is speaking on behalf of God, and they say, this is going to take place in the future, what must take place in order for that individual to be a true prophet? What they said has to happen. So we've got two tests already. If they disagree with scripture, false prophet. If what they say doesn't happen, False prophet. Let's look at another test. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. 1 Corinthians, 14th chapter. 1 Corinthians is in the New Testament. Right after Romans, you have Corinthians. We're going to 1 Corinthians 14, verses 3 and 4. 1 Corinthians 14, verses 3 and 4. And it says this. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 3. He that prophesies speaks unto men to edification, to exhortation, and to comfort. 
He that speaks in an unknown tongue edifies himself. He that prophesies builds up or edifies the church. So the true prophet is not going to tear down God's people. The true prophet is going to seek to do what? To build people up, to grow the kingdom of God. Now, is it possible for a true prophet to write or say something that is contrary to what you want to do? Absolutely. This is why the Bible would say in 1 Timothy 3.16 that the word of God is profitable for doctrine, for teaching, or for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. Nobody likes to be corrected. So if a biblical prophet in here corrects our habits, sometimes we get offended. And we put this down for a little while and we're like, Bleh. And then we pick it up because we love that relationship with Jesus. If the, an end time prophet tells us something that is contrary to our own heart's desire and that prophet over here does not contradict scripture and it doesn't compromise the church but is building up the church, should you and I listen to this prophet? Absolutely. Why? Because they're passing the biblical test. All right, let's read now 1 John chapter 4 and verse 2. We could have read this when we were there a minute ago, couldn't we? 1 John chapter 4 and verse 2. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 2 says, 1 John chapter 4, near to the book of Revelation. 1 John 4, 2. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. Is God going to send a prophet at the end of time that says that his son did not come in the flesh? And if someone says that Jesus didn't come in the flesh, what are you going to call that person? False prophet. That's right, dear sister. You're going to call him a false prophet. So these are our tests. What was test number one? What is that? They're not going to contradict the Bible. That's absolutely right, Sophia. Test number two, what was test number two? Who said it? What'd you say? What they say has to come true. What was number three? What was that? edifies and builds up the church, doesn't tear it down. It builds up the body of Christ. What was number four? Testifies that Jesus Christ came in the flesh. Look, dear friend, if God said, I'm going to send somebody over there, and that somebody over there is going to tell you that oatmeal is good for you, then what should I start eating? But what if I don't like it? Nope, you put butter and salt in it. This is the point. We can expect, because we are sinful human beings, that the Word of God is going to correct us, and any prophet that God sends in 1844 or beyond is going to correct us as well, because God is perfect and we are not. And so this is what I'm going to have for you next Sabbath. Next Sabbath, I'm going to have a book for you. It's called Steps to Christ. You can take that book and you can read that book. It's short. And it talks about having a relationship with Jesus. It's written by Ellen White. I am not printing off any of the junk that I found from the rest of these people. Because that's a waste of time and money. Because I did the research and they didn't pass through the filter. But I'll tell you what, if you want to look every one of them up, take a picture of that screen. Look them up. Here is the point. Whoever it is has to pass the test. In my research, 
Ellen White passes the test. And it's not just because I'm a Seventh-day Adventist pastor. It's because she passed the test. Now, do I like eating oatmeal? Exactly. <laughs> By the way, I don't know whether she said eat oatmeal or not. I don't know if that's a reality. You like oatmeal, Liam? You put sugar on it? No? Anything? You get it out of a packet? Pour it in a bowl with a little hot water. How do you eat your oatmeal other than with a spoon? You don't know? Who makes it for you? Is she a good cook? Yeah, so it's probably pretty good oatmeal, huh? My wife's a good cook too, but not oatmeal. <laughs> I think the point has been made. God said there's going to be a prophet. The burden of seeing who is a true prophet over there rests upon us based on the filter that God gives us, has to agree with the word, has to build up the church. What they say has to come to pass. If it doesn't, pay no attention. So, what's your homework this week? Memorize Joel 2. <laughs> Has anybody noticed that's been our scripture reading for the last like four weeks, three weeks? Sophie, are you ready to pray and go eat? Are you ready? Have you enjoyed being here? Yeah, you're precious. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, wow, Lord, there's so much more that we need to study. And we want to thank you for giving us every day up until the second coming to spend time studying your word. You've given us that option, and we're excited about it. And Lord, as we read Steps to Christ, as we read some other publication by Ellen G. White, Lord, we're going to have our filters up. We're, we're going to have our, uh, our radar screen is just going to be hyperactive because we don't want to be misled. And so we want to thank you for giving us the tests of a prophet by which we could know if that was you speaking over there in 1844 or if it was a false prophet. May you be glorified in our time spent with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.